just like this. Okay, I recorded it. Sorry, that would have been a problem for those that can't be here. Um, and so where was I? Oh, yeah. And so what, I'm, what always amazes me is that we can get generate interest and get people you know, on board with this. And before I turned the recording on, before we started, we have um, Kim Phillip here is with us. And she was our first client and our first cohort back, I, I think this is now our fifth one. So she was with us in the first, second, and third. Um, working with Grace Centers of Hope, and she reiterated that um, they're still at the stage, even now, um, even ever, though everybody's had a chance to understand what's new with the GED, college and career readiness standards have been around for many years now, that there's still this gap in resources. And so what we're doing here, she, she verified, at least from her perspective, it's still very much needed. So I really want to thank everybody for what you're doing in terms of the service to, um, to our adult learners and to the educators. In terms of our agenda, um, let me get this out of the way. The, uh, what I really want to make sure is get everybody's um, calendars up to date with um, what's going on once the MOOC starts, as well as a couple things that I just want to make sure are on your radar screen, both before and then uh, after, kind of continuing after the MOOC. Um, I want to talk about um, getting your assistance in promoting our MOOC. We right now have, and I'll share in a moment, we have uh, just over 500 people enrolled. And it seems like every time I send out an email, another 30 or 40 people. Uh, enroll that weren't aware. So I know where there's a, a, still a lot of people out there that aren't aware of what we're doing. School isn't in session yet. So as soon as uh, the fall semester starts in, um, I'm sure we're going to have uh, more interest. And so last time we had about 2,000 people join. The, the, many of those were kind of lurkers, just tourists going through, just pulling some material I could kind of see from their activity. Um, and so I, I'm guessing we won't have 2,000 because we probably had a lot of those curious folks that just came in, took a peek, and, and they'll be gone. But I think I'm, I'm still targeting that we get about 1,000 by the time the course starts. So if I can still you know, have your help in, in helping promote it and getting things, the word out into your network, I'd really appreciate that. Um, and then I really want to spend some time talking about the, the design project as well as the facilitator roles. So that's why you're all here and what um, I'd really appreciate help and support once the MOOC, MOOC kicks off in terms of um, supporting our learners that are enrolled in the MOOC, our MOOC participants. And then I joke, I call it homework, but as I said, the second half of our session today is really primarily for the new facilitators to get a lay of the land, to understand the tools and the resources we're using, um, what our approach is to the design project, where we tend to see the students need uh, in the MOOC need our help and where they need our assistance. And then some other links to some resources that we just frequently bring up and talk about during the MOOC. And so if you're aware of them and are familiar with them, it will help you as, you, um, as you're, you're giving assistance to others. So with that, I'm going to take a second. And just, I know I haven't gotten into a lot of content, but I, please, at any point, interrupt me with your questions or comments, and, and let's just take a kind of a formal second right now. I'll just break. Is, does anybody have any questions or comments, certain things that were not mentioned on the agenda that you'd like to make sure that I touch upon? This is Bruce. Um, I just wanted to hear at some point from people who did it last time, you know, sort of what were the, the big issues that came up, and then also I, the changes that you made based on feedback. I'm sorry, the what? The changes that were made based on feedback that okay. you received from last cohort participants. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and if, if you guys could really, uh, so the first part of Ruth's question was um, to the facilitators who were part of the team last year, what did you tend to see, the types of questions that people asked, and also then the type of uh, guiding feedback that you were giving? Um, and certainly, um, you know, Amanda, Lisi, uh, Cheryl's on here, Kay is in here. Um, if you could jump in and, and help me um, answer that as we're going through, I'd really appreciate it. And there will be some points when we, when we get into what the modules look like. I'll give, a, again, another pause and you guys can answer that. Um, and then to your second part of the question, definitely, I'll go through the changes first, like the, the big picture changes. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Okay. So with that, let's move on. Current enrollment, as I said, is 508, which is pretty cool. We've only been, had the enrollment two and a half weeks, and we have another, what, five weeks or so to go. So we'll see where we get. So as I said, the um, thing I'd really like to make sure ha happens be before the end of this call is everybody's very clear on these important dates. So um, August 8th is our MOOC readiness review with Canvas. One of the things I love about working with Canvas Network, we have an instructional design team we work with. 
And so um, they're pretty excited that we're all instructional designers and educators because they don't have a lot of work to do with us. But um, it's always nice to have that second set of eyes. And that happens next week, starting on the 8th, which is why I have not sent out a link to you for the new course because they kind of like to freeze it. I'm still working on some tweaks I mean, by the 8th that my tweaks need to be done. They're going to look through it. They make sure that, the, the, for example, the badging module works properly, that we you know, are kind of following basic sound instructional design principles. And so that's kind of, their, there's like a freeze that they don't want things touched. Once that opens up, probably midweek next week, I'll send the link out to everybody and then you'll be able to go into the course and see the materials. Um, so kind of keep an eye out for next week to see that. Then I... Given, as I said, we most of us have been on the projects be before, either in a student capacity or as a, a volunteer facilitator. I'm going to try to get away with just this meeting plus one more. Um, and I selected a date on August 25th, which I know a lot of you will probably be back at school and back. At, it might be hard for you to join us. So we'll do the same thing. I'll record the session and post it. And if you could just reply, if you click on that link that says August 25th, if you could just reply whether or not you're available. And if you're not, no big deal. I will try to post it. But like I said, I'm, I'm hoping we can just get away with one more meeting and then just correspondence via email because I know everybody's really busy getting back to, uh, to the fall. Um, the MOOC official dates for the class start September 12th and it runs through December 4th. Um, last time we extended it, I'm hoping we don't need to do that, but um, we'll see. Um, I it really, um, we'll see. I'm, I'm kind of hopeful that we can try to get things to close down before the holidays and, and get things done by the 4th. But if, if people need to, you know, extra time to turn in their deliverables to receive a, a badge, I may have to kind of consider that on the, once we get there. Um, and then also we, as we did last time, uh, I'd like to schedule four live webinar dates. From a facilitator's standpoint, we certainly do not all need to be part of it. What worked really well for us last time is for each of the four webinars, um, I usually tried to get a handful of people to, to support me on those. So we had, it wasn't just me as a talking head. So if you click on that link that says see live webinar schedule, you'll see a pull down um, that will show you the four dates. Um, if you could take a look at and compare it to your schedule and see if it would be possible for you to join any of those. Um, and again, I'll just probably start bugging people if I don't have a quorum, if I don't have at least a few people to help me. Um, but certainly don't feel committed to join those live schedules if it's in any way a conflict with, um, with your work. And then um, the last bullet point here, which is um, pretty exciting for us, we're, we're, as you all know, we're a fairly new nonprofit, and we really have been trying for that. We're, we're, John Bakke in particular, he's on the call with us right now. We're trying to work on those home run grants, um, but just to kind of keep the lights on and get, get our bills paid, we do need to have our first fall fundraising campaign. And so um, we're going to schedule that for November 12th. Um, the preliminary uh, idea for the day-long webcast-a-thon, so it's going to be an all-day webcast where we have invited guests um, in the field of instructional design and education coming on to share their, their basically we're asking them to answer one question, um, what impact will you make? And we'd like them to share their passions, what, why they're involved in education, what, they, what impact they see is necessary in education, what, what, what they're doing in their lives to make an impact. Um, so if you're available on the 12th, it would be a great opportunity just to pop in. Um, and maybe if you are interested in helping us find speakers, you can set, you know, talk to me separately once we start filling out um, what, what we're trying to get. But we're shooting for about 12 um, speakers to join us during the day. So like one key speaker an hour from, uh, from the beginning of the day until the end. So that'll be kind of fun thing to work on. Um, and we talked a little bit about promoting the MOOC. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this slide, but it just gives you um, an idea of the network that we have created. We've got about 3,600 people in our contact database right now. So when you receive an email from me, you're, you're also getting it. <laughs> that's also going out rather to about you know, 3,600 3, other people. We also um, have done, a, um, I think, a pretty cool job in the last couple of years of building our networks on LinkedIn and Facebook and Google, Google Plus communities. Um, so if you click on these links, if you're not already enrolled or joined on, on these, um, feel free to do so. A lot of it's pretty repetitive. Whatever I put in LinkedIn, you may see the same thing in the Facebook group. But um, again, it's just a great way for you to get your name out there as being part of the MOOC and also a way for you to be able to share your perspective on what we're doing and, and try to hook in more people that are part of your network. 
And then I certainly have to put in a plug for Lisi and um, Amanda and I, I know Ruth, I think, and others that are involved in on the Lynx community. That's specific to adult basic education. Um, it's not necessarily an instructional design community, but it's a very robust community. And uh, for those of us on the instructional design side who aren't as familiar with adult basic education, it's a great way for you to get a lay of the land, hear what just, um, educators are thinking about, working on, and what their interests are. Um, so I certainly encourage you to go ahead and check that out, participate, maybe share that you're on this project or you know whatever, again, to try to promote and drum up interest for, for people to join us. As far as where to point people, um, we have the same spot we had on our website as in the past. So designersforlearning.org slash openabemooc. And you can click on that link at the bottom of this slide. Um, and um, are you guys able to see the slide, by the way? Yes. OK, good. I wasn't sure if you guys were able to see it. Um, and then that will take you, it's basically like a frequently asked questions about what the MOOC is, the purpose of it, what the focus is, prerequisites, things like that. And then also at the very top, there is a link where if they click on that, it will take them directly to the enrollment where they can enroll on, on Canvas Network. And then this is now, this slide's really getting very specific to Ruth's first question. Uh, what is the course structure and how is it similar or different to the, the prior one? So in a nutshell, the course is nearly identical, except for we worked pretty hard to revise modules two and three. That we've heard from feedback from the students was really the bottleneck. Um, we tried really hard to introduce people to the concepts of, of the, um, the college and career readiness standards. And unfortunately, we just really bogged them down. Um, it's a, a pretty significant document, as we'll see. For those that aren't familiar with it, we'll talk about it toward the end of this discussion. But um, so we spent uh, most of the summer working on ways, literally up to about 15 minutes before we started here, um, on how we can make uh, this, the, uh, the transition between um, module one, which I'll talk to him about in a moment what the modules are, to then getting folks exact, uh, into the mindset of designing instruction. And so uh, to your point, Ruth, that, that was like the number one piece of feedback we had from students was that module two was a bear. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. I think we lost a lot of people in the course that they, they, they just were like puzzled by it and, and couldn't quite make, pat, make their way past it. Mm -hmm. um, another thing we've added, we had it there in the past, but nobody really took us up on it, um, was a, an option for students to work in teams or as groups. And so we made it a little bit more prominent within the course on how you can do that as an optional thing if you want to. It's really nothing, I, I purposely set it up that it's not going to be facilitated. So it's really nothing that you guys need to necessarily worry about. It's more of a voluntary thing if they are interested in partnering up. Maybe they have someone from their program or their school that they're in and they want to work on a group project for a class or whatever it may be. It, they just now have a, a dedicated, a little bit more clear dedicated space on how to, to do that. So once you have access to the course, you can go poke around and look at it, but certainly do not feel obligated to, in any way, shape, or form, get involved in setting up their teams or anything like that. It's going to, again, just be ad hoc. Whoever wants to set something up, they can. Um, and then really one of the most exciting things we, we worked on um, that's changed from the last course is we now have a bonus challenge. So the prior courses, we've come, our course, we culminated with um, basically a lesson plan with, um, with resources like uh, worksheets or whatever it may be that the designer put together, all designed in OER Commons um, using Open Author. And so again, we have a great partnership with Canvas Network, and they were very interested in what we were doing, and they have a parallel called Canvas Commons, and it's where you can um, store your lesson, your, your, not your lesson, rather, your online learning module. You can store that on, on their version of what would be their version of OER Commons. And so we've crafted a bonus challenge that once, they've, once students have gone through the entire course, turned in their, um, their resource within OER Commons, they can then redesign that as a, an online learning module. So then they'd, they'd be able to incorporate things such as discussion boards and um, quizzes and, and things like that, everything that you're able to use in the Cal Can um, Canvas LMS. And so we, we'll talk a little bit more about where you can take a peek at that. We have a sandbox set up where we designed it over the summer, and now we have a, a group of students from our prior course 
who are um, in there now trying it out. And those that try it out and successfully complete um, a resource in, uh, to, to upload to Canvas Commons, Commons are going to then come and join us as what we're calling wayfinders. And so within that bonus module, we will have a, a pool of people who've taken the module, they've taken our prior course, and they have worked with Canvas and will be able to give support and help. Um, so that's a pretty exciting thing. Um, I mentioned the Canvas Readiness mm -hmm. Review. Um, we'll skip over that. Um, so once you do see the course, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, please, go ahead. Jennifer, can I ask you a question real quick? This is Ruth. Um, so I was a participant last time, and so would I have the opportunity to take the, the lesson I created as a participant and put it into Canvas Commons? Absolutely. Not, necess not necessarily to get a badge, but just to have that experience. Yeah. That. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so um, if you want to look at it over the summer, I don't know if you're, this is a better time for you than later in the fall. I'll, I'll, in a couple slides, I'll share with you the sandbox that we have right now. So you can go in and follow the instructions on how to do it. And actually, if then <laughs> if you do that, if you provide us feedback, how it went, that would be fantastic. So I actually would okay. be thrilled if you would do that. And then, like you said, we'll, we'll give you a badge, but it's fine. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, so I talked a little bit about the format already. So I'm going to skip through this pretty quickly. You can you can read this um, if you have if you want to know the specifics of how the the modules lay out. Um, it does our project does culminate with. Um, oh, you know what? I'm getting some feedback. I'm just going to see if I can get some audio here. There's a little better, sorry. Um, as I mentioned, we do culminate the, uh, the course with offering, a, prior we had one badge, it was called an Instructional Design Service Badge as well as a certificate. Um, but now that we have um, this partnership with Canvas now, we're going to be offering the second badge. So that's, that's I think, kind of a cool thing. And I, we actually did a study in the last course on badges. I've kind of always in my career poo-pooed bad, badges, not thinking that they were that important to people. Um, but we found through the survey many people use them on LinkedIn, which I had not made that connection. And so they, it actually turned out to be, um, I think everybody who did complete the course mentioned that the badging was one of the reasons that propelled them to continue and to finish. So I guess they do provide more value certainly than I probably gave it credit in the past. Um, so let's jump right into um, kind of tying into what Ruth's question was um, and also then bridging the gap for those that did not participate with us. Um, everything in terms of the project-based nature of our course remains. Uh, we've tried our best to replicate a basic design cycle. Um, for those of you who maybe were part of the discussion last year as far as is this an Addy based project, I guess you could you know, find Addy buried in here somewhere, um, but we basically are following the, the chart that's here. We're having the students start out um, with the analysis phase in modules zero and one. Um, where we give them a lay of the land. What is adult basic education about? Unfortunately, most of the people who join the course um, have no idea. They are not, when they think of adult education, they think of graduate school. They, they, in fact, most of our participants in the MOOC have their, um, not only their bachelor's, but their master's, and many are pursuing their PhDs. They are not in the mind, mindset of adult basic education. So our first modules, uh, zero and one, are really giving them a, a full view of the nature of the problem, um, how the number of, in terms of numbers of people, as well as then getting into um, the personas, which give them a more intimate view of who these learners are and what, um, what the different types of circumstances may have gotten to them, them to the point where they have not pursued or been able to complete their high school um, certificate or equivalency. Um, and so that, that's kind of the whole purpose of our first couple modules, is just to get them in the mindset of, of our learners, the need, and the problem. And then in modules two and three, as I said, this is the really hard part, because we have a design course with no prerequisites. And so, we, you know, the theory, there's so much learning theory and instructional theory, and it's, you want to pull out enough that they have something to work with without, as we unfortunately did the last time, overwhelming them with too much detail. And so this is really in these second and third modules where we ask them to put on their designer's hat and start thinking about the, the needs and then how they're going to solve those needs through their instructional intervention, which is the lesson that they're designing. And um, so the, the part that's kind of unique with this is we also encourage them, because what they're designing is open educational resources, we also put in this mantra of don't 
please don't reinvent the wheel if it's already out there. So within module three, we give them an introduction to the world of open educational resources, point them out to places where they can find resources, um, get a little bit into what licensing is and things like that. And so that is now solidly in, in module three. Um, and then we, in modules four and five, they really formalize their deliverables by uh, preparing a written design proposal. We have a template, which I'll share with them, we do in a moment. And then finally in module five, they pull their um, design proposal into OER Commons um, using um, Open Author. And they actually then develop a prototype in Open Author um, based again on, on the design template that we've, um, we've, we've, we've provided them. Jen, yeah. Jen, sure. there's a question sure. on the chat box. I don't have one. I'm just alerting you to the question. Thank the you. Box. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are readings assigned to them? Is this the role? Okay. Yes. All readings are assigned to them. So everything is all contained in the, and that's um, once you're into the course, um, this is a couple things to point out. If you've not been in the course, it's probably hard. This is probably really hard because I'm very conceptual if you can't actually see it, but um, the, the course is laid out on pages where all the content is stored and one nice feature that was added toward the end of our class last time but will be there from the beginning, you can download all of the course content as an EPUB file so students are now able to read the course content on a Kindle or other type of tablet which is going to help a lot because there's a, it, it's very, it's a content dense course because there's a lot we're covering. And so it's very nice then that the students will be able to keep in their, you know, backpack or whatever going to work, they'll be able to have a copy of the course materials um, at their disposal. So that's nothing you need to worry about. Okay, thank you for the question. That's great. And then going back to our design cycle. So after they've designed things, we then incorporate um, a round of evaluation. And uh, I know a lot of you are already familiar with this, um, but I'll just go fairly quickly. We are using what are called the Achieve rubrics. They're built into OER Commons. And um, so the students have the ability to self-evaluate um, or peer evaluate rather each other. And then also um, it's kind of a, for us as facilitators, it's kind of an all hands on deck module, uh, module six where once they get to that point, um, we encourage you to go in and look at their modules and then use the Achieve rubrics to uh, provide them feedback. And as I mentioned in the second half of this presentation, I have all kinds of resources for you as a facilitator to learn about what these Achieve rubrics are, how the evaluation process works. Uh, so don't worry, that's all, that's all covered uh, before, before we end here. And then finally, the last module, which sounds like not a kind of a no-brainer module, but I think it was interesting to watch the difference between the students who turn in work in module five, which again is their prototype, going through that formative evaluation and then and how they, the changes they make in module seven. So we kind of guide them through that process of, okay, you, you, you put out a prototype, you received feedback, now here are the things you need to look at to, um, to make your final adjustments and amendments. And that's when they turn in their deliverable and get their badge. Um, and so the sandbox I mentioned, um, so that, that's, those are the first seven modules. That's the core part of the course. Then this bonus module that sits at the bottom, again, is the, um, the ability to create um, the, the Canvas LMS resources that will go up on Canvas Commons. And if you'd like to play with that, Ruth, I think you mentioned you'd like to play with it, and certainly everybody's invited to, to join. Uh, we have a, a little core group. I think Janet's in there. Um, Susan Jones is in there. Some others are, um, have already have done some, some little bit of homework in there. Uh, but if you click on it, it will take you, you'll have to maybe do a, a brief little login process. It's, unfortunately, it's not the same login that you'll use in Canvas Network. This is actually created on um, a Canvas Free for Teachers account. Um, and again, this will be moved into our course, but for right now, it's the sandbox we're using just to, uh, to work, work through the kinks of the prototype that we're using. So feel free to do that. So now I'm halfway through, and I think now we're probably getting to the part everyone joined in for, like, what am I doing here? What's my role? Um, and so really most important, and I, I, again, if anybody would like to chime in at this point, I think Ruth was saying if, uh, if the uh, prior facilitators could share with, with all of us what their experiences were. I'll just kind of give my two cents um, to kick it off. My, my objective for the facilitator role really is an ambassador for the, the MOOC. This very much is a self-study opportunity. As I mentioned, all the course content is there. Theoretically, someone could just charge through it and not 
care or post or you know whatever and still turn in a lovely de deliverable um, I'm sure but we really are embedding the whole course in this peer-to-peer -peer as well as the, the, the interactions with our, our core group of subject matter experts um, and so really what we're looking we're looking to do is keep our eyes and ears open for support opportunities and some of that is, uh, if you look at the, down at the bottom of this slide, it's the formal responsibilities. Um, we'll talk in a moment about specific modules that I've assigned each of you to, to be in, in charge of moderating the discussion. But then also, and this is I think where it would be helpful for others to chime in, um, just kind of be also aware and cognizant of the other modules. Maybe we have a help module, we have Ask a Subject Matter Expert, and certainly there are other discussions happening in the other modules. That if you just kind of keep your eyes open and, and maybe not respond to everything you see in those other modules, but get a sense for where the questions are coming in, where people are stumbling, um, it will just help you as you're providing um, facilitation support within your module. And I think I'm going to stop talking right now. And maybe, Lisey, I don't know if you have the ability to talk right now, but Lisey, you certainly were a powerhouse facilitator in terms of providing a lot of discussion board support. Could you backfill um, your comments on, on the type of support that you provided? Well, what I found myself, and I'm, my voice isn't the best, but I, if you can hear me, I'll continue. Yep. Um, what I found uh, students had most problems uh, understanding, well, the CC, you've already mentioned the CCRS, and you, it looks like you've addressed that. But uh, first of all, a lot of these uh, developers uh, are not aware of andragogy. They're not aware that adults learn differently than children. So they're, they're very ambivalent about how to develop a lesson for adults. Uh, the other th major point is that uh, this MOOC is designed to create life-solving problems. And they uh, and everybody, my students have problems with that too. What is the difference between a real life problem and an academic problem? And they're two very distinct things. People drop out of school, uh, in high school, because they don't understand the academics. And these courses are designed to apply academics to solving problems that relate to people's lives. That's a very difficult concept. So people will argue with me about, well, getting the GD is solving a life problem. No, GD is a very academic process that is designed to help students solve life problems. Uh, writing an essay is a life, no, writing an essay is an academic skills skill that leads people to be able to function in an environment that requires good, solid writing. If you say, okay, my lesson is going to be designed to write a report on a uh, health case study, yes, that is a life problem. Or if, uh, well, fraction, I'm gonna teach them how to use fractions. Well, where would you use fractions to solve a life problem? That's what we want. We want them to take an academic skill and then say, how are you going to use it? That's how adults learn. Adults learn by connecting what they're learning immediately to their interests, sometimes to the demands in their lives. But uh, those are the two concepts that I to always get in there and try to give examples to help students uh, hear this to an application that makes sense to adults. Those are basically where I found myself most involved. Yeah, I agree, and that's great. Uh, thank you, Lisey. Um, and Cheryl, I don't know um, if you can, can hear us, but you again also were very much a rock star in, in all the topics that um, Lisey just mentioned. Do you have any, you wanna add your two cents if you have your microphone available on, uh, in terms of the support you felt you needed to give? I might have one cent, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, sure. Great. Uh, back in module one and two, you said that they didn't understand the student. Another thing that I found that they didn't understand was their environment. And, and Kim maybe can uh, give us some 
better information. It's been a while since I've been in adult ed, but they can't, the, the participants of the program trying to design went about it in two ways. One, they thought because they were doing this online that it should be an online um, environment. And secondly, they, they, and this is common for, for all teachers, they had been participants in a classroom where everybody's learning the same thing. And they didn't realize that in adult education, often students are doing independent projects. I mean, you know, you might have one student who's working on math and the person beside of them might be working on uh, reading. And they, one might be a third grade level and the other may be an eighth, ninth grade level. And they didn't, un they didn't understand that, which I can certainly understand why they didn't understand that. But I was wondering if anything had been done when you were talking about sections one and two, if anything had been done to help people realize exactly what the environment looks like. You know what, not as much as, you just reminded me of a couple really important points that I'll make sure, um, and if you could also offer your, like when you go back through and read how they've come through, if you have recommendations on how we could enhance a section to, to really reinforce what you're talking about, um, and it is hard. We, we, we do have some videos of, um, I think it's actually an American Institutes for Research video of what the adult education context looks like. Um, and we kind of talk every once in a while about the run one room schoolhouse concept and that the lesson plans are really used, it could be used in a library setting where it's a printout or whatever it may be. To your point about, they assume since they're taking a MOOC, they're designing a MOOC. I, that was a really weird, I think a lot of the people in their introductions even said, oh, I, I, I'm joining this class so I can learn how to design a MOOC, and I'm not sure you know, how that was lost in the translation, but um, hopefully then by us having the bonus challenge, that will help them try to, you know, fulfill that need to be able to design something in, in Canvas, but definitely excellent points, and I've written both of them down as far as the, um, the, the context. Um, and then also, tying back to ways to get the, to reinforce this message as you said certainly in the discussion boards what we tried to do in the first webinar that we had last time and actually in the second we invited participants in the class who do work at an adult ed um, classroom to join us and give us their perspective of what it looks like what their day looks like and the students that they work with and so what i've done is i've uh, crop that crop the section where we have the, the different people adding their perspectives and we're now including that as part of the module so hopefully that will help um, it is hard to it is hard until you hear the stories I think to really understand it but I think that would be an excellent addition and and the last thing is is it's still in the same concept is they assume that the facilitator, the teacher, or the instructor, whatever you want to call them, is is in charge where they really can't be because of the individualized instruction and they have lots of activities for the instructor to do and to prepare for the class. Um, oftentimes, or at least in my, my experience, we have part-time instructors uh, teaching these classes. They don't, don't have that kind of time to do a lot of preparation and they and they certainly can't get around to handing out a lot of things and you know when when they're doing individualized instruction okay okay so that's i wonder do we have um i wonder if, i'm trying to think of ways that we can help um give exemplars from the prior we have about 40 completed modules do you think that might help to show some examples of what is required in terms of sufficiency within the, the content of, of what, because I know exactly what you're saying. Like sometimes they'll say, the teacher needs to create a worksheet that does whatever. Well, no, no, you need to create that <laughs> worksheet, or, right? Is that, is that kind of what you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. And, and they, they'll say the instructor will, I don't remember specifics, but they'll have specific things that they want the instructor to do, and that's just not always realistic. Um, and, you know, they don't have access to internet. Um, there's just, oh, it, they just don't un understand the environment. Okay. Yeah. Or, or the environment that, that I have seen. And like I said, I think that Kim can probably address this much better than I. Uh, but that, those were the things that I, that I saw. 
that um, aside from being um, a little bit or maybe sometimes a lot academically advanced for the GED student. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, not understanding the environment was the, the biggest thing. Okay. Okay. I've written that. I do think that your idea about giving them some examples, I know <laughs> even though I'm an old woman, I'm in graduate school right now myself, I loved it when my instructors gave me a sample to go by and depended on it a lot and, and being able to, to point out the ones that have been done in the past be great. That's great. And, and uh, in the, I'm just looking in the chat. Uh, Janet um, was one of the prior participants and um, put together a great resource. So and she's volunteered her lesson for conversation. So I think what I'd like to do is um, move from this just so we can keep, um, keep going. And let's dedicate our August 25th session to certainly not a presentation from me, but a conversation among us facilitators of these points like what you know what what we saw what we should be prepared for um, where we can point folks to resources um, and again make our August 25th date a, a really a good discussion on um, on this point basically picking up on this slide uh, so just in the interest of time I think I'm just gonna plow through here a couple more slides um, then thank you both um, for, for the that, that I wrote down everything you said because it's it's very valid points so the way we facilitate the course, if it hasn't become um, obvious already, we have the seven modules, again, culminating seventh really is just turning in your assignment. And so we really consider it like pit stop facilitation. So we know people won't necessarily go from point A to B directly. They may decide they want to, um, oh, hang on a second, let's see, pass that. okay, I want to just read Amanda's thing. Um, they, they may just skip ahead and do a little reading in module five and then come back to module three and whatever. We, so we, we don't necessarily, we know they don't necessarily follow this direct path. But in terms of how we provide our facilitation, I have assigned um, each of you to one, probably two modules that you'll be responsible with a team of, of three or four other people to moderate that particular pit stop. And so I've given a recommendation. Um, if you click on the link here, it will take you to um, a, a Google Doc. And I will open it right now, actually. So if these dates don't work for you, or once you start reading the material in the module and you're like, I, I, this is not my area of expertise, I, I really would rather work on another module, just let me know. I did my best to try to pe put people in where I thought they would um, be able to provide the most, um, the most value. But again, that's just my, my high level overview. One thing I did point out, and actually Janet mentioned it to me, I forgot that on um, a couple big weeks for us, AECT and then also Open Ed are big conferences that a lot of us will be attending. And so if, if you also have a, um, a, uh, a conflict that uh, comes up and you can't, you know, for whatever reason, you don't think that that's going to work out for you. And one thing to notice, I, I should just describe what this is. Even though we don't know the dates that people are going to hit these pit stops, we have a general sense based on the timing of the last class when people will hit. So I'm calling it like the estimated peak activity. So assuming everybody starts on September 12th, they should hit, for example, module three by October 17th. Like the, the, the bell curve should be you know, peaking out at about that point on, on October 17th. So um, what, what I'd like to then kind of include with that is that we do have our Ask a Subject Matter Expert and our help form, which just runs constantly through the course. And it's when people aren't able to find their answers within the modules, they may just get stuck um, like on a kind of bigger picture issue that's not addressed in a module. And then they'll post that question to either the help forum or the ask a subject matter expert. And so where I've listed the weeks, that's really where I need some extra backup. I tend to answer the majority of those questions, but if you could then provide me some additional backup support, if it's your on-call week um, or weeks, if you could um, hop into the help and ask the subject matter expert to yeah, help give me a little bit of back, back support, I'd appreciate it. Um, so any any particular this is pretty important. So I'll take a second. Does anybody have any questions about how this works and maybe comments from those who we did this the last time how it worked uh, worked for you? Anything jump out obviously that uh, will not work on your schedule? Not obviously, but I have to check the conferences. Okay. 
Um, all right. And then Amanda, I did see your question as, we're, as you mentioned it. Is it possible to develop personas for the different types of classrooms so participants understand potential environments? Oh, excellent. Okay. Okay. So beyond the person, like the different environments, the different. Um, okay. Let's add that to the list. <laughs> okay. Let me know if you need help. With oh that. yeah, I, I would need help with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we could back channel on that and maybe give maybe we could send out then to the group some, you know, we could come up with some and then ask for additional help on that. That's great. Okay, we're about getting to the point where um, if you need to leave it, you won't be missing much if you've been been around the block before. Uh, in terms of the discussion moderation, again, it's hard to conceptualize this if we can't if you haven't actually looked at our course. But um, if you've ever used an LMS, there's going to be a, a, a navigation on the left side, and one of them is discussions. You click on that, it will open up the the roster of the discussion modules, and then you will just again be responsible for the one that you've been assigned, as well as being backup support for the others. Um, and so that really concludes my, these are the changes for the course. Um, did anybody have any questions as far as the, the, what, I've, what I've talked about so far? And I'll get into the, the details of the, of the rest after this. Um, I think my only question is about the writing of objectives. Okay. Um, as I know, Lisi and Cheryl kind of hit on all of the things that were really common, but I thought in reading the comments that people really struggled okay. with writing objectives, and I was wondering if any additional support could be provided, even if it's just sharing some samples from the previous lessons that were developed that received that feedback from Lisi and Cheryl. Okay. Okay, let me do that. Let me add that. Perfect. And I'll write all these down. When I send out the course, what I'm going to do is, in my email, I'll say, these are the things I attempted to do. How well did I, you know, did I do what you were <laughs> suggesting? And then if you have other suggestions, if you could just let me know. Um, but I'll, I'll make a first attempt at pulling, like you said, I'll go through, I know exactly what you're talking about. There were several points when Lisi and others would mention um, how they could improve the writing of their objectives. I'll pull that, those, that feedback and, um, and pull it as exemplars within, within the module. Jennifer, I have one more question. Sure. Um, excuse me. Uh, regarding the amount of time for the lessons. No, mm -hmm. very, very that's done. That's gone. That's, okay. That's gone. Great. There's no requirement. We removed the requirement. Now what we're going to do is to talk about scope. And so just, you know, in terms of like, how much time do you have to devote to designing this? So just be cognizant. Like if you want to create a semester long multi-lesson, tiered lesson, you know, that's on you, you know, to, to figure out how you're going to get that done. You know, make it more, put it on them to figure out the length of the lesson they want to create. So no more 20 to 30 minutes. No, and that really is a legacy thing from, we've, because we really want, we want to be also cognizant of how much time people are volunteering for our service, service learners. And so obviously the larger the scope, of the lesson, the longer it's going to take you to design. So that's really kind of where that came from. Great. Okay. And that is hard. As we all know, scope creep is probably the one of the toughest things. Um, okay, so I'm just going to barrel through this. I, I know I've been a talking head already, but now I'm really going to be a talking head and just point you to some really key resources that are going to help you get a handle for the, the content and the material that's covered in the course. So as I mentioned, um, we heavily use OER Commons, and so uh, as I put in capital letters in bold, that this is important. So Jennifer, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Ruth is having trouble with her phone, so she just asked me to um, ask how the evaluation part of the lessons looked. Um, meaning, how did that that the module go? Like, how, or how did we think the, the lessons turned out? I'm going to go with B, but I'll wait for her <laughs> the second oh, okay. part. Okay. Um, yeah, it, you know, it's a learning experience, so it was hit or miss. You know, some were excellent, and some were, I want to get a badge, and they turned something in that, I, you know, I don't know if I get, was giving an A, B, C, D, you know, grade. I don't know if they would qualify for the, the, the A's and the B's. Um, and then some, like I said, many, this is brand new. So what I think the beauty is of what we're doing, uh, not to couch my answer, but sort of to couch my answer, we, 
we will certainly have the opportunity to revise the lessons that have already been submitted because they're OER. So a lot of them, it's, it's, I think it was uh, Cheryl that mentioned it. They have a great skeleton shell for what needs to happen, but maybe they didn't develop all of the resources that are required. I think that's going to be really part of my message to the students is go back to our pool that we have and feel free to pick up on the resources that someone else has created and take it to that next level. And we do have the feedback on most of the lessons, either a peer or one of the um, SMEs was able to provide feedback, which is attached to the lesson as part of that achieved rubric. Um, so I, I'm sorry it's a long-winded answer, but it really isn't a good or bad answer. Some were, some were good and some were, they need revision, and we have the opportunity to do that. Okay. I hope that answered the question. So um, back to the um, what I'd like you to spend some time on. So do please make sure you pop over to OER Commons between now and August 25th um, to, to check things out. It's a really important part of the course. OER Commons comes up in almost every module. Um, we also, to, to the comments that uh, Amanda was just asking and Ruth were asking, this is where you can find all the resources that prior learners prepared in the last MOOC. So if you click on the link that it's at the bottom there, that will take you, I think there are about 40 resources that are in there. Um, and maybe uh, to kind of to help answer Ruth's question, um, feel free as you're looking through it to use the evaluate feature to add your two cents as you're going through it. That would be fantastic because it's, it's certainly something you're able to do right away. And I'll, I'll share in a moment how you do that. Um, so when you're, um, if you're not familiar, I would have to say Open Author is one of the easiest pieces of technology I've ever used. If you can use a Google Doc, you can use Open Author. However, it's you know bell curve. We have some folks that really struggled with it, and some that were like, "This is like almost too, this is really too easy. I'm not able to have the functionality I like." So, if you want a nice overview, um, I've included some links here to videos. Um, here's one that gives you an overview of what Open Author is. Um, one thing to point out. It, it may be a little more confusing than it used to be in the past because they have um, OER Commons now has different authoring plat platforms. We are still continuing to use Open Author. So when you're on the home page, if you click on the Create button, the next dialog screen you'll see is uh, is this one. And so as I mentioned, there's three different authoring tools you can use. The left side is Open Author, the second is a Lesson Builder, and the third is a Module Builder. The, the, the two on the right are for K-12 and for higher ed. Again, we're continuing to stay with Open Author. That came up a little bit. Some people try to push us to, to try the other ones, and it's just a different animal, and it really doesn't work for our purposes. So once you um, click on Open Author, as I said, it's a very easy authoring tool. It looks a lot like Google Docs. In fact, you can import a document from Google Docs. Um, and so you, you, you have a screen where you write your content. Um, you have a screen then uh, where you describe what your lesson is. And we give students within our lesson materials prompts um, on how to, to populate all of these screens, particularly how to, to um, archive your and tag your resources so others can find them. And then finally, submit, which is then where they're allowed to select the license. Um, all of the resources are Creative Commons in some way, shape, or form, but then as we all, or most of us probably all know, um, you have variations on the type of um, permissions you give within your Creative Commons license, and this is where they make those selections. So I just really encourage you, if you haven't pay, played with OER Commons and played with Open Author, go ahead and um, review those videos, and um, it, it, again, the learning curve is it's pretty quick. You should pick it up pretty quickly. Um, getting back to that um, part of your role that does get into the evaluation, if, um, if you're uh, unsure what I'm talking about, once you have access, access to the course, head over to Module 6, which is the evaluation module, and there's additional instructions on, on how the evaluation process works. But in a nutshell, each resource that is created in o, um, Open Author has the ability to evaluate it. So as it shows here in the number, number two, you click on that um, number two or the uh, the link underneath the number two where it says evaluate and it will take you to the achieve rubrics and these are rubrics that have been pr prepared not by us by others um, as a common way to evaluate the quality of a resource and if you want more information on the achieve rubrics and how the evaluation works within OER Commons feel free to um, to check out the video that I've listed here um, and then also then how the evaluation process works 
Uh, and then moving on, I'm going to go pretty quickly through these. These are just things, please just take a ch chance to read. If you're not familiar with the College and Career Readiness Standards, here's the link that will take you out to the document. It's a huge document. Please don't read it. It's 140 pages. Skim it for content. Skim it for gen general like layout and flow. That's, that's all you really need to, uh, to understand for, the, for our purposes. Uh, because once you start helping students with actual resources, that's your time to drill down to the tables to really see how the, um, the uh, standards work. And again, they're aligned with the uh, Common Core. So if you have any familiarity with Common Core, that will help you out. The last uh, couple things that I'd like to point out, um, one being our design guide. As I mentioned, we kind of interchange the word. It's a template or a design guide. It, it basically is prompting the students for the things that they need to consider within their lesson, um, that what needs to be included. Part one is just general lesson description, part two is the lesson, and part three is how to document their, the resources and, and proper citations and things like that. So if you click on the link that it's the bottom of the screen, that will take you to the actual design guide that the students use. Um, lays out what the, the project requirements are. And as Lacey just mentioned, uh, we did have a requirement before for the, the length of the lesson we wanted to see. Those types of things are all laid out in the design guide, the, what the project requirements are. Um, and then the last kind of important couple things here get into our basically in our instructional philosophy, I guess, if you uh, want to put it that way. And we've, we've kind of put our, all our eggs in the, the Merrill's first principles basket. Again, there's lots of different ways you can um, think about instruction and what needs to happen. But Merrill is very much a Gagne believer and, you know, student of Gagne. And so it's, it's kind of instruction 101, we think, and it, it, it kind of is a nice flow and pattern for how students think about how a lesson should be structured. And what's one nice thing that is about it, it starts with the problem, which gets into what Lisi was talking about, like very much focused on real world problems or tasks, gets into their motivations through discussions of activation and integration and application, and I won't go into all these. You can read the, the article that's, that's linked in here. But what we really like about it is um, after we started digging into it, it's very much like the LAKIA. I, I always forget the acronym, but it's the, um, the lesson planning framework that um, is, is advocated. I think is this the, um, did AIR put this together, um, Amanda? I'm not sure where this came from. Um, yeah, we led the TEAL project. Okay. Right? So we, and we used WAPIA, yeah. And so it was a project to work with adult educators on best practices for creating lessons. And so if you look at, you can easily align the WAPIA framework to Merrill's first principles. So if you spend some time reading first principles in that, um, you'll be pretty well served to get a lay of the land for what our, our recommendations are for students to design their lessons. Uh, and that's it, we're done. I, I don't know, <laughs> I, I wonder if anybody even, I was talking too fast if you even heard what I was saying, but any questions at this point or comments? Nice job. <laughs> Need my water. No, seriously though, we got you know five or six minutes or whatever, whatever you need as far as questions. Um, I, I'm very open to anything you'd like to talk about. Real good recap, Jennifer. Great, thank you. So does, does that sound right with everyone that if we just plan on one more on August 25th and we'll keep it very free form and open where it's just a discussion among us facilitators of the things that we either see want tweaked before we kick off in the, in the course or also then support for each other in terms of um, how to provide support within your assigned modules. Is that okay for an agenda? I think we're... Sounds good. I know you gave a link, but you, uh, at the top of your head, do you remember uh, what time you scheduled it for? Uh, you know what? I moved it um, to, we had, this one's during the day, so I moved this one to the night. It's, it's going to be, the, I think, a 7 o'clock central, which is what? 8 o'clock, 8 Eastern. Uh -huh. Okay. Anything else? Going once, going twice. <laughs> this is a quiet group. All right. Well, thank you guys very, very, very much. And keep an eye out for emails coming from me. And the most important being next week when I'll actually give everybody access to the class. And feedback is very much appreciated.
Thanks, Jim. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.